Well, my name is Ray Gallegos. Um, I'm a fourth generation North Denver resident. Um, we're, right now we're in Rhino, um, which is basically right between uh, Glowville and Five Points. To me, um, for people calling it Rhino, it's more of a metropolitan thing. They're trying to make the city um, more, I guess, fancier than what it is, you know? And, uh, you know, they're trying to mash together neighborhood names and uh, get real, real foofy with everything. So that way people, you know, attracts more, more yuppies. Between Glowville, Larry and Swansea, there's around uh, 200 plus um, licenses for marijuana industry, um, whether it be edibles, uh, dispensary retail, or just recreational uh, sales licenses. So um, the, the most things that you can really tell that there's a lot of dispensaries here is the smell. I mean, every time you drive down the highway or you, you know, walk, you know, go for a walk with your kids or, you know, any, anywhere in the neighborhoods, really, if the wind's, the, you know, blowing the right way, you smell weed, you can smell the Purina dog food factory, you know, so it's uh, just a mix of everything. Main things that you probably notice are a lot of the buildings with um, green crosses on them, which you know represent dispensaries, and you could buy weed here. Um, there's a lot more of cars from out of out of state. There's a lot more licenses that you see out of state driving down the street. Um, nicer cars uh, from, of course, the places where dispensaries are are a little more frowned upon, like Cherry Creek and Highlands Ranch and um, North Glen. Um, Boulder, a lot of the places where people would rather do their dirt in other places, especially in, in our community where they feel that this is the, the ghetto or the hood, so they want to come here and smoke their weed and, and buy, buy their legal, legal drugs, so that way they don't have to tell mommy and daddy that they're smoking weed. A lot of the dispensaries here in our neighborhoods are basically um, they're using a, this platform to get rich. It's like they are predators and looking for the easiest way to get people to come in and buy their products, you know, whether it be minorities or black people. A lot of times it's so easy because it's uh, glorified in, in a lot of the urban culture. To me it is uh, detrimental to the neighborhood because it, it just offers a lot more accessibility to marijuana to our kids. and and people who've never experienced uh, weed before. This community is one of the poorest in the country and basically right now what we're trying to do is we're trying to get these dispensaries to be a part of the community. Be, hey, if you're gonna be here selling weed to all these communities, you need to be able to pay the tax to do that. And I'm not talking about state tax or government tax because everybody knows that just goes into the pockets of politicians. I'm talking about tax to be here and ser you know, basically serving customers in our community and making millions of dollars uh, um, every six months to basically come into our neighborhood and invade it. Gentrification is, is basically people coming into your neighborhood and uh, stripping it of resources and uh, changing the, the, the culture of the of the environment that's inside of that. There is absolutely a link between cannabis and gentrification. Um, not only is it bringing more people in from outside of the state, out of the, even in some cases out of the, from out of the country, it's also bringing more traffic into our neighborhoods from the suburbs. It's um, bringing more, um, more problems, I believe, as far as like drug problems, um, people going back to, you know, prison, going back to jail, a lot, a lot of the min minorities um, start to believe that it's okay. You know, like a lot of these kids out here um, are of color, kids of color, like, you know, Mexican, uh, black kids are, they believe that it's okay because it's legal. So they, you know, they start smoking even sooner than they did before. So they feel like, hey, it's legal. My mom and dad have it in their room or I can get it from my friend because they have their license. So I'm gonna go ahead and start smoking. And what they don't understand is that they've already got the, the odds weighed against them. They're, you know, they're people of color. So they're already um, st statistically uh, more, more 
likely to go to prison. They're statistically more likely to develop uh, addiction, not be able to get good education, not be able to get a, ho a home, not be able to get good credit. Um, so all this stuff just adds to that. Gentrification is, is a direct link to this new marijuana boom. I mean, there's people coming in here that have never lived in Denver their whole life, so they don't understand what it is to appreciate Denver or to know the history or to know the culture that the area provides here that they're, being, they're actually part of destroying. A lot of these dispensary owners make you know, upwards of twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 in a single month um, you know, and that adds up to millions of dollars over the year, and that's just a small dispensary. So basically what they're able to do is they're able to buy homes from people who are not being able to pay their taxes uh, behind on their mortgage, um, who are, you know, either sick or maybe not, you know, needing money for something. So they're able to go ahead and, here, oh, I'll offer you cash for your home. Here's, you know, here's um, $150,000 for your home that's that you bought for 70,000 back in 1993 or whatever, you know, and they go ahead and they buy that home for 150,000. They sometimes they don't even do anything with it, you know, they just slap a for sale sticker on it and people come and buy it for double or even triple of what they bought it for. I am angry about what's going on because uh, people don't it's it's a total disregard for the way that our community has been one of the main cornerstones of Denver. We've actually had a lot of people who lived here for generations who have built Denver, who have, who have been the ones to um, build the homes, uh, the, do the brick, the masonry, the carpentry, the people who have go to work to throw people's trash away and are hardworking people. And we basically get dismissed. They have no, no, I'm, I'm not gonna say no morals, but they have, they, they turn a blind eye to a lot of the things that are going on. I don't feel that the same people who put my family and my friends in prison back just 10, 15 years ago should be the same people that are making millions of dollars and benefiting from this same substance that, that is uh, so detrimental to my race and my, you know, my people. I would like people to know that they need to step up and if they feel something is a, a negatively affecting their life or their community, they should speak out about it. The Anti-Displacement Coalition is um, basically just a, a group of neighborhood leaders and um, nonprofit organizations who are here to um, find solutions for the, the housing crisis that's going on, the people who are losing their homes through the gentrification, through the development of the surrounding areas, through the rise in taxes, through the, um, the change in our culture and uh, the influx of so many people every week. There's a thousand people that come here every week, new to Denver, that are here looking for jobs, looking for homes, looking for marijuana. <laughs> but a lot of times what they're doing is they're basically pushing the people out who've been here for generations who are unable to continue to pay the rising rent and the rising taxes. So it is a very big problem. And what the coalition is doing is we're trying to, like I said, preserve our community, our, our neighborhood, our, our, our history and our roots. It's important for youth to have a voice and our voices can go a long way. I don't want to live in a world where I know that I could have changed something. We are the future. Because we're the youth and like it's our job to like change the future, but like nobody knows how to do it. I think Project Voice like really just took off the blinders, you know, from my eyes to really see that people are really suffering. Project Voice's mission is to develop future leaders in underrepresented communities by training, employing, and organizing youth to work on challenges in their schools and communities today. Being a change agent and like really reaching out to people has really like shaped my life and to really become a transformational leader. You get more engaged in problems when you know how they impact you. I just want to become a better leader and be able to teach other people how to become a leader also. We create a safe space for young people to 
understand the world around them and their position in it. You're looking for solutions for the betterment of not only themselves, but the community as a well. whole. Young people have power and control over their destinies, and we teach them how to step into that power. Just meeting new people and laughing. I think the conversations. Knowledge, like you go there and after a day like your brain hurts because you learn so much. Through Project Voice, uh, I was able to manage my projects more effectively, uh, manage being in school, manage being a sister. Project Voice is about giving young people the tools, the environment, and the language that they need to collectively shape the future. Here I am organizing, leading, strategizing, and helping out my community in a positive way. It's a no sensor program. Getting the mind flowing and just like really thinking about the future and like how we can improve. To teach me how to be an organizer, how to be an activist in my community. You are the next generation and it's up to you to change what you want to change now. Nothing about us without us. My name is Candy Sidabaka. I am the co-founder and executive director of Project Voice in Denver. Um, I am also a member organization and resident of the Anti-Displacement Coalition in Swansea. We are currently in the Glowville neighborhood of Denver. Um, sometimes people refer to it as Rhino because of the art district overlay and this is one of the neighborhoods that has a disproportionate concentration of the marijuana industry in Colorado. Um, we are in, next to the neighborhood Swansea that has the highest concentration of the marijuana industry in Colorado. I think that in Colorado, as pioneers of the legalization movement, we didn't put a lot of thought into protecting community um, we also didn't anticipate the influence of capitalism on legalization. Um, a lot of us who voted for legalization voted um, with a social justice frame of mind and we were really voting to decriminalize marijuana, not necessarily um, invite it into the capitalist system the way that it has been. And so when we were thinking about protecting community and over-policed communities, we weren't thinking about how legalization of this industry would change the face of our community and change the feeling in our community. And so gentrification right now, I believe, is very strongly connected to legalization, um, primarily because we're the sexy place in the country because of legalization. Lots of people are interested in being a part of this industry, whether for social justice reasons or for capitalist reasons. So we're the place where people are coming and we didn't equip ourselves to deal with that. The industry's grow facilities were limited to areas that were zoned for industry and in Denver that has historically been communities of color and communities that live in poverty. So now we have disproportionate concentrations of the industry in poor and minority communities where we have less political power and less financial power to go up against a community that has both of those things. And I think our sense of, our ideas of community are probably different, not aligned. So I actually moved away from Denver for about six years. I moved out to D.C. and I was in D.C. during the process of legalization here in Colorado. I did not um, get into this world until I moved back to Denver in 2014. And I only got pulled into this because I live across the street from four grow houses. And that kind of naturally sucked me into this world of advocacy because it wasn't my target area. It never was, and I never thought it would be. Um, I got involved because the first raid in Colorado by the DEA happened across the street from me. And um, it 
the moments leading up to that raid were really um, scary for my family. My grandmother lived in my house and I was in DC when that raid happened and she had been telling me about people stopping at her house, knocking on the door, asking if she had seen the owners of the grow house and she would tell them no and they would get like really pushy with her and start accusing her of lying. And when the raid happened, we found out that there was a lot of uh, bad business happening there and that there was some trafficking. And the people that were looking for the business owners thought my grandma like would have known when and where they were. And so as my grandma watched them pull out the plants and throw the plants in the middle of the street and seize everything, I was on the phone with her trying to figure out how is this happening across the street from my grandma's house? What's going on? And I didn't quite understand the impact when she would tell me she can't go out on the porch anymore because she feels like she's getting high from the smells. And I just dismissed her. You know, she was old school, so I didn't pay attention until I moved back and experienced it myself. Um, I didn't realize how in how intense it was and I didn't realize what it was like to live across the street from this industry. And so when I experienced it firsthand, I didn't have a choice but to get involved. I think that we lived in a part of Denver that was um, ignored, um, neglected in a lot of ways by business and by our government. And so we didn't have a diversity of business in the community. And I think the few businesses that we did have in the community were like mom and pop shops and um, very small businesses. What legalization has done is it's created this competition for these spaces because licenses are limited and because only specific areas are, des are zoned for industry in Denver. And so people who want to start businesses or keep businesses alive in our community um, are finding it to be a challenge because of the cost now. Um, gentrification is looking very different in our community because we're not seeing the fixing and flipping and scraping houses and uh, fugly houses popping up. We're seeing 68 to 72 percent increases in our property taxes and nothing visually is changing around us. Um, we're seeing fences go up and surveillance cameras on these buildings but we're not seeing the same kind of gentrification and that's because every open space in our community is being eaten up by the marijuana industry. I think it's getting much easier for me to um, make my point about equity within the community. I think that a lot of people in the community supported decriminalization. Um, lots of people in our community are people of color, so we were forced into this black market because we had no other choice. And what people are seeing now is not what they expected to happen. They thought we would have a meaningful role in this legalized industry and that the criminalization, all of that would change. We haven't seen um, a real shift in criminal, decriminalizing it. We also haven't had a place at the table in the industry. There's one um, African-American business owner and one Latina business owner in the state of Colorado in the industry. And people are now seeing that. So the people who voted for legalization and thought it was a good idea a couple of years ago are now seeing that it is not helping communities of color and in fact it's harming us because the huge complaint here in Denver right now is this housing crisis and people paying taxes which is 50 percent of my community a very stable community they're seeing their taxes increase and they now know the connection so where I was arguing with people last year or maybe the year before about the harmful impacts of this um, inequity on our community and they disagreed. Now they have tangible proof that it hasn't been good for us and we're waiting for these new members of our community 
to step in and align their vision with ours for protecting the community and um, ensuring stability in our community. I think that when we were we actually fought the city when they were trying to lift the moratorium on licenses because it was already clear that there was a disproportionate concentration in one neighborhood and or a couple of neighborhoods and so when they when we were in those negotiations we brought up um, ideas of an impact fee or um, community benefit agreements and those somewhat um, translated into their legislation when they lifted the moratorium. And so there's supposed to be some kind of um, cap that like gears down over years. We're still watching new people come into the community and it's not stopping in the neighborhood. But the community benefit agreement is now a requirement. Is it substantial right now? No, not at all. Um, there's not a lot of oversight and there's not a lot of meat or teeth um, in any of the community benefit agreements or plans. And so I, but I do think that that's an opportunity. I think that for the industry to recognize their impact, um, to recognize what they're doing to the community and recognize that they want to be there for the long haul, they have to understand that those agreements need to have more intentionality and they need to translate into impact. So working with the community to understand what our vision of the place we live in is going to be critical. Um, we did fight one renewal of a license and we won. That was our first victory in this whole thing. And I think that that is like one example of what can keep happening if they don't get on board with the communities that they're a part of. Um, I don't think they're happy about the way Denver has uh, regulated the industry or taxed the industry. And I think that we can find um, a common, I don't wanna say enemy, but a common challenger in this whole thing. And we can align ourselves and work together for what's good for both of us. I'm sure they would like to see their tax dollars having an impact in the spaces that they occupy. And we want that too. So there's definitely opportunity for them to engage and ensure that the profits that are being taxed, that tax money is going into the spaces they occupy and impact. Um, I think that we also have to have a real conversation about how money that's made in the industry and is being invested in real estate is harming our economy and harming our um, housing situation in the city. That is not being tracked right now and that is very hard to track because it is a way to wash your money overnight but it is the most harmful unintended consequence of the industry right now in Denver, Colorado, and wherever else they're going to legalize. We need policy advocacy. What the cannabis industry has created is a very strong lobby and political um, influence. We need help and we need them to leverage that, um, that body of power to help us fight for the policy changes we need. And we also need them to fight for their dollars, their tax dollars, to go where they're impacting the most people. In general, I would like people to understand that um, there are communities that, are, that have had a disparate impact. Um, we need them to understand that the unintended consequences are not being tracked and they need to be tracked and it's affecting a lot more than we recognize. And if people care about equity in education or housing or dealing with our homeless problem, we have to take a serious look at how the cannabis industry has impacted all of those things. Understand how capitalism works. Understand how neighborhoods are zoned. Land use is important. When you're considering legalization, you need to know how 
your city uses different pockets of land and how the cannabis industry will fit into that plan, prepare for it. Um, you have two different parts of the industry and one part is the ugly part, that's the cultivation part of it and then you have the dispensary side of it which is the retail part. A retail space is going to have a completely different set of concerns than a grow facility is. And knowing where to expect concentrations and mitigate before they go there. Setting caps on the amount of licenses, making sure that licenses for both types are evenly distributed across the city. Those are the types of things that ensure equity. Making sure that there are equity goals in who is getting licensed, making sure that there are equity goals in um, who is being employed by both sides of the industry and tracking all of that data for the next state that decides to legalize is important. I'm not going to lie to you, like people in my community were using it legal or illegal. Like it didn't change um, the, ac the level of access we had to it. Um, it didn't change um, what we used it for. And so people in my community still have access. Um, access is a little bit easier, but for communities where they told us years ago that there was this effort to take drugs out of our community, I think it's been a slap in the face to see more drugs come into our community and we're not even part of that industry anymore. And so now it's seen as like an economic driver and um, an economic benefit for the city. I don't think that there's any turning back now. Um, and I think my solution, considering what I've said today, is probably going to seem strange, but I think that the whole country should just legalize already because I think part of what's making it a challenge for us here in Colorado is that we are one of the few. And so there's a concentration that I don't think we would see if it was legalized across the country. I think that um, making sure that we're paying attention to the important equity goals um, treating it the way we have treated liquor stores now that we know where liquor stores go would be a first step if anyone is like going to do it across the country but I think that it will get better when it's legal across the country and so I just want them to hurry up and do it already and I want all the people who have flocked here for it to go to their like respective spaces because um, it's too late to turn back you know I think that the message is the same across industries you know we live in a society that is inequitable for people of color and people who are poor and people who don't have access to capital and so any industry should be conscious of these things should be conscious of how they're affecting the communities they're doing business in and so I just want business owners, entrepreneurs, to understand that they don't operate in a vacuum and that if they want to be part of the future and they want to be innovative and they want to adapt for the changing face of society, we need to take into consideration a whole separate set of goals related to fairness, justice, and equality.